This week on Worldview, Quad and SCO summit meetings within the same week. Can India continue to walk this non-aligned tightrope or is it really attempting to put its feet in two very different boats? Hello and welcome to Worldview at the Hindu with me, Sohasini Heather. Madhya Asia ki is aithyasik daror ke aadhar par SEO ko radicalization aur extremism se ladne ka ek saaja template develop karna chahi. On two Fridays, one week apart, Prime Minister Narendra Modi is attending two very different summits that some would call, in fact, geopolitical contradictions or antithesis of each other. On the one hand, there is the SCO or the Shanghai Cooperation Organization that is made up of Russia, China, Pakistan, um, Central Asian countries like uh, Tajikistan, which is the host, uh, as well as Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan. Uh, India is a member and it has just inducted Iran as well. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Prime Minister Modi has a visit to Washington to attend the US, Australia, Japan, India quadrilateral summit and he will have bilateral meetings on the sidelines of that. Uh, the question is, what are the differences then between the SCO and the Quad and why are we speaking about India's um, non-alignment or its strategic autonomy as it is now called? Uh, the first point, the SCO-led Russia-China organization is really seen or was seen when it was started as a counter-NATO organization, a reaction really uh, to NATO, while the Quad which includes the US and its treaty allies like Japan and Australia is seen as a coalition to counter China and by extension Russia uh, and India of course is a member of both so that's why that question comes up. Now remember India joined the SCO in 2017 while the Quad which had originally begun after the tsunami in 2004 it formally began in 2006 it was then shelved in 2009 but revived again in 2017. So in a sense, India's uh, membership or uh, engagement with both the Quad and the SCO in modern times, in, in current times, really relates to 2017, just four years. Uh, the SCO, of course, deals with India's continental neighborhood, its neighborhood to its north and its west, uh, including Afghanistan. While the Quad really deals with India's maritime neighborhood, the Indo-Pacific region uh, and, and the Indian Ocean as well. Now, barring India, all the SEO countries or most of them have taken a stand that largely accepts the Taliban a government in Afghanistan, for uh, for example, the, Afghanistan is not a member of the SEO, but does have observer status over there. All of these countries like Russia, China, Pakistan, Iran, uh, and the Central Asian countries are essentially in talks with the Taliban. They've held dialogues in the past. They want sanctions against them reduced. And of course, Russia, China, Iran, and Pakistan also have embassies in Kabul. Quad countries, other than the United States, uh, have largely stayed more distant from the new Taliban regime in Kabul. They have not opened dialogues except for a few meetings. Uh, and other than the US, they don't have their embassies anymore. The US is still uh, running its embassy from Doha. Now, at the SEO, and this really makes it very interesting, the kind of contradictions, India takes part in meetings, even military exercises, counter-terror exercises, with countries that include China and Pakistan. While at the Quad, India is part of naval exercises and uh, frequently is part of statements that decry regional hegemony and cross-border terrorism. Uh, this is language seen to be aimed at China and Pakistan. Um, Prime Minister Modi also took part, remember, in the Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa BRICS grouping uh, last week, which also seems internally divided on some of these issues and some of what are being seen as these two poles in the new world. So you could ask, can India really sustain this tightrope? Uh, or has the Modi government, because this has all happened in the last few years, bitten off more than it can chew for the moment? The first point and in answer to that is really that India is not the only country that is in multiple multilateral groupings that conflict with each other. Just take a look at some of the examples. Pakistan, for example, in the 1950s was part of CENTO, it's a treaty organization with the US, while also then working closely with China on a number of platforms. Turkey is a member of NATO uh, with Europe as well as the US. 
but also a part of several groupings with Russia and China that, uh, that, that don't come together. Uh, US is a part of qu the Quad, but then it has too just announced, in fact, just a few days ago this week, has announced a new trilateral on the Indo-Pacific. So not the Quad, but something called AUKUS, Australia, UK and US. Uh, that could be something that in the future could conflict with the Quad or tie in with it. It still remains to be seen. It's certainly an issue that has now got France very upset because France uh, is uh, against the nuclear partnership that Australia and the US have now forged because it planned uh, to ha it did have an agreement on a nuclear partnership with Australia itself. Um, two months ago, the US also announced another quadrilateral. This was a connectivity quadrilateral that went with uh, the US, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, although it's unclear where that will head with the latest developments in Afghanistan. And while they compete on every other sphere, the US, Russia and China together formed something called the Troika to discuss Afghanistan and then uh, brought in Pakistan for the Troika plus. For uh, a few years now, that is what they have done. While the US has maintained the Quad and Russia and China have maintained the SCO and even formed the Russia-India-China trilateral, neither of those two sides actually included India in any of those Afghanistan conversations. Clearly, in a multipolar world, it is possible to be part of many different groupings depending on what is the issue at hand. India has found common cause with both groupings on some of the issues and has had differences with the others. So let's just take a look at what are the issues that these two organizations really look at and what is India's stand on them. Uh, to begin with, while ensuring a free and open and prosperous Indo-Pacific region is really at the base of the Quad revived platform, the leaders, and they met for the first time virtually earlier this year, uh, Mr. Biden, Mr. Shuga, uh, Scott Morrison of Australia and Prime Minister Modi, have focused on three verticals. The first being countering COVID, and it includes a vaccine initiative that uh, is supposed to be a vaccine built in India, uh, with American expertise, in other words, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which would then be exported, uh, a billion vaccines would be made for all of Southeast Asia or uh, ASEAN countries, so the Indo-Pacific countries, if you like. The problem here is that while India has signed on to that, uh, uh, to that idea, uh, it is not finding any support to push through the WTO proposal that India is a co-signatory to, asking for a waiver on patents for any of these uh, COVID materials. And India, for its own part, has so far blocked giving indemnity, uh, giving a sort of insurance waiver to the United States for those vaccines. So it really remains to be seen how Johnson & Johnson, which is an American vaccine, can be produced in India as a part of the Quad Initiative. Uh, second, really, are climate change issues. India has worked with Quad countries on the Solar Alliance, on the Paris Accord. They have very similar goals but it has not yet signed on to some of the things the other countries would like to. Uh, for example, net zero by 2050, uh, that means an end to carbon emission uh, in net, as well as ending coal uh, as a source of, uh, of thermal power. These are all deadlines that these more westernized and developed countries have already signed on to, but India as a developing country is waiting uh, to make any announcement. So there is no sort of uh, common position as of, as of now on, on that part of the quad. Then you have uh, the third silo, which is critical technologies and resilient supply chains. Now, while India is keen on building alternate supply chains, especially on technologies, critical technologies with partners, keen to end dependence on China, and we've seen this with the 5G debate as well. It is not a part of the Osaka track that was started by Japan along with other countries that uh, really includes the other Quad countries, and that is an uh, agreement on cross-border data flows. That's not something India is a part of. So let's turn across the aisle to the SCO now and take a look at what they discuss and what is India's position there. And again, we see some differences. For example, uh, the SCO runs what is called the Afghanistan Contact Group, where ministers or deputy ministers come together. Now, India has not been on the same page as most of the SCO countries, as we said earlier, when it comes to dealing with the Taliban. Uh, India shut down its embassies and says it is only engaging the Taliban to ensure the safety of Indians and that there is no terrorism spillover. 
The second point that the SEO discusses is connectivity. Now, India is not a part of China's Belt and Road Initiative uh, and does not, in fact, sign on to the specific paragraph in the SEO joint declaration that deals with BRI. Tensions between an India and Pakistan uh, also mean really that India is not part of any of the connectivity discussions that the other SEO countries are working on, uh, whether it is the Belt and Road Initiative or how it ties in with the Trans-Afghan Railroad or the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. China has a connectivity arrangement now, a big deal with Iran as well. Um, and India's Chabahar port which was seen as a way of, of diverting around Pakistan, does not have many takers within this group as a result of that. The connectivity plans for Central Asia and Russia and China, Pakistan and Iran seem to be, uh, uh, in a sense, not on the same page as what India is looking at. And then, of course, there is that issue of terrorism, which for India is a core issue. And India blames Pakistan squarely for cross-border terrorism into India for providing shelter and safe haven to terror groups, including those that have attacked Afghanistan, and that includes the Taliban as well. However, other countries in the grouping, in the SCO grouping, are actively engaging with Pakistan in order to deal with the Taliban. And then, of course, the SCO has something called the Regional Anti-Terror um, uh, uh, Structure Mechanism called SCO RATS, which includes India. Uh, that conducts annual counter-terrorism exercises between the militaries. And remember, Pakistan is a member as well of that. In short, despite India's growing ties with the US and growing tensions with China and some distance in its relationship with Russia, it does seem that for the moment, the government is keen to continue walking the tightrope, maintaining non-alliance uh, or strategic autonomy with both sides, while they are making polarized choices and the fears of another Cold War between the US and uh, the China-Russia combine, the question is, can India continue to do so, not take sides between the two? So we do have a lot of reading recommendations for you on this. At the Hindu website, you can find specific profiles of the SEO, the Quad, and in fact, in BRICS as well. Uh, the links are given below. Apart from that, several books you could read. One is called Non-Alignment 2.0, a foreign and strategic policy for India in the 21st century. This has many experts, including Sham Saran, Shiv Shankar Menon. It's edited by Sunil Kilnani. There is, of course, a book I've, I have recommended before called The India Way by External Affairs Minister S.J. Shankar, because that really gives you a sense of where the government stands when it comes to its adherence to strategic autonomy. Uh, there is a book by very famous American uh, diplomats called Teresita and Howard Schaefer called India at the Global High Table, the Quest for Regional Primacy and Strategic Autonomy. That kind of, ex the title explains what the book is about. Next, there is Indian Diplomacy Beyond Strategic Autonomy by uh, another diplomat, an Indian diplomat called Rajendra Bhyankar. And finally, two books uh, by the author Zoravar Dalat Singh. One is called Power and Diplomacy, India's Foreign Policies During the Cold War. So that tells you a little bit about the history of India's stand, as well as Power Shift, India and China in a Multipolar World. Now that is all we have time for here on Worldview. But from the team here, thanks for watching.